We're now starting our chapter on optics. And to begin that, we're going to start with a fairly simple observation. So here, I have a tank filled with water. Uh, there's some milk of magnesia in here, so it's a little bit murky. Uh, the reason for that is I have a laser here, and I want to shine the laser into the tank of water, and I want to be able to actually see the laser beam. So to do that, I need something for the light to scatter off of. Uh, I also have, uh, to my left, just off of the camera, uh, a smoke maker, uh, like you'd see in nightclubs or uh, Halloween stores. Uh, that, again, is also to make the air a little bit murkier, so there's some particles in the air for the laser light to shine off of. Uh, let's see what happens when I uh, turn that smoke detector on and then shine my laser light into the water. Got my smoke maker on. I'm going to turn the lights off so we can see this a little better. You can see my laser light gets bent as soon as it hits the surface of the water. So, why does it do that? Why do I get a bent laser line as soon as it hits the surface of the water? The bending of light as it passes from one material to another is called refraction. So, in the case of the laser light shining into the water, I had some material up here, in this case the air, the light comes in, hits the surface of the water, and then it bends, moves at a different angle. Um, here, notice that the angle is measured between the light ray and a line that's perpendicular to the surface. Now, it turns out that to determine what the angle of refraction is going to be, you need to have a you need to know a material property called the index of refraction. So if you have two materials, uh, we will call n the index of refraction. Each material has a different index of refraction. So material one, where the light starts, has an index of refraction, we'll call it N1. Material two has an index of refraction that we'll call N2. What exactly is the index of refraction? How is it defined? Uh, well, it turns out there's a weird property of light. And so the index of refraction is defined in kind of an, uh, in a screwy, kind of interesting way. So, if I want to define the index ref of refraction, it's defined in this way. I take c, which is the speed of light, divided by, actually I should be explicit, I should say this is the speed of light in vacuum. So it turns out that light moves at different speeds in different materials. Uh, and any material that is not vacuum, light always moves slower. So it's always fastest in a vacuum. Uh, but if I try to shine light through glass or some other material, the light actually slows down a little bit. So the index of refraction is defined as the speed of light in vacuum divided by V, which is going to be the speed of light in the material. So light will move at different speeds in different materials. If the light is passing through air, air is not that much different than vacuum. It's mostly empty space. So the light moves very close to the actual speed of light in vacuum. If light is traveling through water or glass, it's going to move a lot slower. You can imagine that the little particles of light are constantly getting absorbed and re-emitted, and that's going to slow up its average speed so that uh, the time it takes to pass through that material is going to be a little bit slower than it would be if it were moving at its speed in vacuum. So how do we actually measure the speed of light? Well, it turns out people have been measuring the speed of light for a long time, since about 1676. Uh, this measure, first measurement was due to a, a man named Romer. And what he noticed is that he, if he looked out off into a telescope, uh, he could see the moons of Jupiter. And then a funny thing happened if you looked at the moons of Jupiter. So if I look at the moon of Jupiter, you know the moons of Jupiter are traveling around Jupiter just in the same way that Earth's moon travels around the Earth. Uh, let's say here is you on the Earth, and you see Jupiter's moon. The light is traveling from the moon to the Earth. And uh, 
it takes a certain amount of time to do that. Let's call that time T1. Well, if I wait a month, if I wait a little while, the moons of Jupiter will be in a different spot, which means they're going to travel a different distance to reach the Earth. If it's traveling a different distance, then it's going to take a different amount of time. So if you go off and you look at the moons of Jupiter, what you can find is that sometimes the moons of Jupiter seem like they're ahead of schedule, and sometimes they seem like they're behind schedule. So specifically, if the moon is in front of Jupiter, it's going to seem like it's a little bit ahead of time because the light doesn't have to travel as far. So T2 is going to be a little bit smaller. And if it's behind Jupiter, then it's going to seem like it's a little behind schedule because the light has to travel a little bit further to reach us. All that's going on is that the light takes a little bit of extra time to travel that extra distance. If you know what that distance is, and you know how much time it appears to be off, you can measure the speed of light. This is what Romare did. He came up with a value for the speed of light. Uh, his was uh, significantly off of what we know now, but what we know now is that the speed of light is about 2.9979 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So it turns out there's a fairly simple relationship between the incoming angle and the outgoing angle. We're going to call the incoming angle the angle of incidence. That's the, light, that's the angle that the light comes in at. We're going to call the angle that the light leaves at the angle of refraction. As I said, there's a fairly simple relationship between the angle of incidence and the angle of refraction. That relationship is just given by something called Snell's law. Snell's law says that the index of refraction for the first material times the sine of the angle 1, the index of ref the uh, angle of incidence, equals the index of refraction for material 2 times the sine of angle 2, the angle of refraction. So index of refraction for material 1 times the sine of the angle of incidence equals index of refraction for material 2 times sine of angle 2, the angle of refraction. Why does light bend when it enters a material? Well, it turns out physics is a little screwy because light follows the principle of least time. When light goes from one point to another, it tries to take the path that takes the least amount of time to get from point A to point B. And I think a helpful way to see this is to look at an example. So let's say here's you, and you have a friend that's swimming. So we have two different mediums here. You are out on land, your friend is swimming. And your friend happens to be drowning. So here's your friend. He is screaming for help. You want to get there and stop your friend from drowning, and you want to do that as fast as possible. Well, which path are you going to take? Let's look at the yellow path first. Well, you might think, well, let me get into the water as fast as possible so I can save him from drowning. So you run quickly to the beach, and then you start swimming to your friend. Well, that's not necessarily a good strategy, because most people swim way more slowly than they, than they can walk or run. So if you run to the beach really, really fast, you have this much distance that you have to cover in water, moving more slowly. So most of your trek is going to be spent moving very, very slow. So we don't want to go on this path. You might say, all right, well, let me take the shortest distance to get there. Shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So you take a straight line path for your friend, to your friend to get there. While this is the shortest distance, it's not necessarily going to be the shortest amount of time. The reason being that I am moving slower in the water. So if I spent less time in water, I could get to my friend even faster, uh, even if I went a little bit of a longer distance. So what we're sacrificing is we go a little bit of a further distance to be able to move, to get from point A to point B in a shorter amount of time. So this path is not the path we want to take. 
since I can run on land even faster. It's got to be true that if I go a little bit further on land, I can get a little bit closer to my friend and I can reduce the amount of time that I spend in water where I'm moving slowly. So you want to take this path. You want to run, you want to get as close to your friend as possible before you dive in the water. Maybe not as close as possible. But you, want to, you want to maximize, you want to minimize the amount of time it takes. And you can do that by getting closer to your friend and spending less time in the water. And this is exactly the same thing that light is doing. When light leaves from point A, we said we're leaving in land. The light is leaving in some material. In the example we did before, it was air. Then it passes into water, just as you do trying to save your friend. Uh, and you want to get to point B. Well, it can take the least amount of time to get from point A to point B. When you're transforming, when you're going from one material to another, you're going to bend, uh, you're going to have that light bend because it wants to spend less time in the material that it is moving slower in. Let's test your understanding. Here, I have light coming in at a certain angle. The light leaves at a larger angle. The angle of refraction is bigger than the angle of incidence. I have two questions. Question one, where does the light move faster? Question two, where does it have, which material has a bigger index of refraction? Material A that I start in, material B, where the light leads. So the two questions, where does the light move faster? What has a bigger index of refraction? Which material has a bigger N? All right, what did you come up with? Where does the light move faster? Well, the light is trying to get from this point to that point. And it could have moved in a straight line. It could have gone along this path. Which would have meant it spent more time in material A. But the path it actually took is spending less time in material A. Therefore, it must be moving slower in material A because it doesn't want to spend as much time there. Light wants to move, uh, light wants to take the least amount of time to get from point A to point B. So light must be moving faster in material B, because it's moving slower in material A. So it's moving faster, oops, faster in material B. It doesn't mind spending as much time in material B. What about question number two? What has a bigger index of refraction? Light's moving faster in B. I know my index of refraction is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the material. So if the light is faster in B, then it must be true that V is a bigger number in B, so that N is smaller. Which means if I'm looking for a bigger index of refraction, material A is going to have a bigger index of refraction. Okay, here I have a converging lens. Here's my lens. And we can see that if I hold my lens over this pen, the lens magnifies the pen. So this is a converging lens. If I look at it from the side, you can see it bows out a little bit. A converging lens. A converging lens is basically what you have in a magnifying glass. So why is it that when I look through a converging lens, I get something, I get an image that appears to be magnified. So we're going to look at a converging lens first. I have here in this holder a converging lens. I have two laser pointers that are uh, aimed down at the converging lens. We can see that right here. And we want to see what's going to happen uh, when the light passes through the converging lens. Now, it's difficult to see what's going on right now because we can't actually see the lasers. 
I've got a smoke machine over here that's going to create some smoke that will um, give the, uh, the light something to scatter off of. Once we do that, we can see what's going on. So let me just turn off the lights. Here you can see my converging lens. You can see those two laser beams coming into a point. The light, laser light comes in straight. The beams converge as it passes through the lens, and then they intersect. Got my two converging laser beams coming in. They converge, and they intersect at a point in the middle. It's fairly easy to find the focal point of the converging lens. All we have to do, again, is just trace some light rays in and see where they line up. And if we send in a few horizontal rays, we will see, there we go, here's some green light. The first light that passes through, which is coming horizontally, since it's coming horizontally, it's just going to pass straight through. It is not going to be refracted. So that's an easy one to draw. I'll draw my next line. I'll do that in red. Let's go up here. So that will come in this way. And that is going to get refracted down because it's a converging lens. And we'll see that it's going to make the light rays converge upon a point. One more ray coming in horizontally. There we go. There. One never realizes how difficult it is to hold a ruler or meter stick straight against a whiteboard until so you actually have to try it and make a straight line. So go a little further. My blue light is also going to converge onto the same point. The point that it converges on, again, is just called the focal point. So you send horizontal light rays in. Those rays converge on a point. That point is called the focal point. I have my lens. It's a converging lens. I have a focal point there. A focal point right here. And again, we're going to draw three lines. The first line I'm going to draw, I will have come in through the focal point and go out horizontally. Let's line that up. Come in through the focal point. Now really, The light's not over here, it's coming off of my object. So the light's coming in through the focal point. As we said, the ray itself, the actual light, is not passing through the focal point, but it's lined up with the focal point, and it will come out horizontally. That's easy enough. What about light ray number two? Well, light ray number two, let's have that, uh, let's have that pass through the center of my lens. And it's just going to go straight through. And for light ray number three, Let us have it go in horizontally and come out through the focal point. So light ray number one, the red light ray goes in through the focal point, out horizontally. Light ray two goes in straight. The third red light ray is going to go in horizontally and pass out through the focal point. In horizontally. And let's pass back this way. through that focal point. Now again, the light is diverging. It appears to be diverging over here. The rays are getting further and further away from each other. 
But where does it look like those rays are coming from? Well, let's trace the lines of light back. The green light ray, I'll line this up, appears to be coming from over here. My red light ray, appears to be coming from over there. And my blue light ray appears to be coming from the same point. So all three of these light rays converge this point right here. So I appear to, and the way I've drawn it, it appears like it's lined up with my focal point. That will not necessarily be the case. I'm going to draw it over here, a little bit behind my focal point. So it would appear that I have an image that gets formed. However, we should note that these light rays that I've drawn as squiggly lines aren't really there. Remember, that's where the light appears to be coming from, but it doesn't mean the light is actually coming from over there. Really, the light ray leaves from the object and then just passes straight through. So, the light appears to be coming from over there. So that's where it's going to look like the object actually is. So let's look at where the object appears to be. We'll call that the image. And we're going to note a few different properties about the image. One thing about the image, well, it appears to be magnified. It's bigger. My image is bigger than my original actual object is. Converging lens is basically what you have in a magnifying glass. The other thing is it's upright. So my arrow, both arrows are pointing up. So when I look through a lens that's shaped like this, I look through a converging lens, I'm going to see an image that's magnified. It's not going to be flipped upside down. It'll be upright. The last thing about it that we can pay attention to is that it appears to be uh, it is, uh, it is not going to be a real image. Right? There's not actually light coming over here. It's not actually going over there. Which means I cannot hold up a screen and project this image onto it. I can't make a movie of this. So for that reason, since I can't actually make an image, we call it a virtual image. So my image, it's magnified, it's bigger than it was before. It's upright because it's pointing in the same direction as the original object. And then finally, it's a virtual image because I can't actually project that light onto the screen. It's not really there. I'm looking at this side of a magnifying glass that just appears to be coming from over there. So here's my object. It's got light coming all off of it. We'll look at the light leaving that point right there. Over here, I have a converging lens, and I've got two focal points. And I'll highlight right here. So the way to figure out where the image of this object is going to be created uh, using this converging lens is, again, to trace three light rays. So we're going to do that here. And we're going to trace, trace three very specific light rays. The first light ray we're going to trace is going to come in horizontally and it's going to leave through the focal point. So I know that, that light ray is coming in horizontally, pass through the focal point. So we'll have this light ray come in horizontally, and it will pass out through the focal point on the other side. That's light ray number one. 
light ray number two, I am going to have pass straight through the center of my lens. So we're just going to pass straight through the center of the lens. Try to line that up as good as possible. Light ray comes in, and since it's passing through the center, it will not be refracted. There we go, that's just because of the symmetry. Now, I'm going to use, I'm going to do one more light ray. I'll draw the third right light ray in blue. That one is going to be, the third light ray is going to be the opposite of my red light ray. So, the green light ray passes straight through. The red light ray comes in horizontally, leaves through the focal point. The blue light ray is going to be the exact opposite. It's going to come in through the focal point and come out horizontally. So let's try that. I can line this up correctly. Comes in through the focal point. And it comes out. Just a bit. It comes out horizontally. Now you can see my three light rays all converge at the same point. They converge at this point right here. So what we can say is that this is where an image of the object is going to be made. There are certain properties of this image that we can, we can note about it, just by looking at it geometrically. The first thing I can say about it, well, originally the arrow was pointing up. Now the arrow is pointing down. So the image has been inverted. It is now flipped upside down. The second thing about this image is the light is coming into focus at this, at that point. If I were to hold a screen at this point, just like a projection screen, I would be able to actually make a real image of the object. This is how you make, how you project movies, for example. We can actually get an image in focus of the object that's over here. So I have a real object over here. I've got an image of the object much like a movie being projected on a screen. Since we can really make an image of the object, we're going to say that's a real image. The last thing I will say about that object, or the image rather, is you can see it's smaller than my original object. So we could ask, is it magnified or reduced? In this case, it would be reduced in size because it is smaller than the original object was. Here, we have a diverging lens. It's diverging, if you look at it, you can see, uh, hard to tell, but if I were to try to pour uh, cereal or soup in here, it's bowl-shaped so that there's some bowl in there where we could hold the soup. Uh, so it's concave inward. You can see when I look through a concave lens, the pen I have down here gets smaller. The image of the pen appears to be smaller than the actual pen itself. So why is it that when I look through my lens, I have a, what appears to be a smaller pen than I do in reality? There is some reflection here, but you should be able to see and you can, that those lines start to diverge a little bit outward as they come in. You can see here they start splaying out in different directions, even better. On this side, you can see the laser beams come straight in. They bend outward. All right, let's find the focal point for a diverging lens. As always, I'm gonna start by drawing one line straight through the middle of the lens. And that 
pass straight on through. Up next, I will draw a red line. Just a bit above the center of the lens. Coming in this way. And then refracting outward at some angle. Red line comes straight in, gets refracted up. Green line comes straight in, goes straight through. Finally, we have one more line to draw. Let's see. Here. Blue light ray coming in. And being refracted out. Let's see if I can line this up. Now, much like mirrors before this, we can see that when the light bends away, we, are, we do not get, uh, we appear to not get a focal point. But, much like with our mirror, if I look for where my rays coming off the lens are, where my refracted rays are coming from, they appear to be coming from a point over here. So as long as I trace back where my refracted rays are coming from, I can see that there is a focal point. And that focal point is right there. All right, let's see if we can figure out where the image will appear when we're looking through a diverging lens. Let's start by tracing a few rays through, um, through my lens and see where they end up. I will start Drawing a horizontal line from my object. We have light coming in horizontally. We said that for a diverging lens, if it comes in horizontally, it will pass through the focus on the incident uh, ray's side. And when I say pass through, I don't really mean that the light is actually coming from there, but that it appears that the ray were to come from that point if I were to just trace it back. I really come in this way and then refract up. Next. Let's see what happens when I pass a light ray straight through the center of the lens. see, I get something that looks like this. Finally, let's remind ourselves, we came in horizontally, out through the focal point on the left, went straight through the center. Next, we're going to come in through the focal point on the right, and then out horizontally. So I'll do that one in blue. See if I can line this up. Should be pretty close. Come in aimed at the focal point on the right. And come out horizontally. And like this, horizontally. Now, where do these rays intersect? Where do my refracted rays intersect? Well, if I look at where 
they appear to be coming from. They appear to be coming from that point right there. So that's got to be my image. So my image will appear to be about this far away from, the, from my lens. So we'll just say that this is our image. Now let's see if we can uh, identify some properties of this image. First of all, my image is smaller than my actual object, so it's reduced in size. What appears to be a smaller pen. This is why when I look through a diverging lens, I see objects as being smaller than they really are. However, it is upright. So I don't have to worry about the image being flipped upside down. Finally, as you can tell from these dotted lines, the light rays aren't really there. We're just tracing them back to where they appear to be coming from. So I can't hold up a screen here and get an actual image of the object. So for that reason, we say that our image is virtual, since I can't actually look at the image by projecting it on a screen. 